A couple of months ago, we were asked to do a survey on the narcotics problem in connection with a program uh, to attempt to curb this difficulty in our community. And I'd like to discuss with you this morning some phases of the subject which could not, in a practical way, be included in a survey for the purpose intended. As the problem may get nearer to us than we realize, I think perhaps we should give it some careful thought. The average person is fairly well fortified against the danger of narcotic addiction. But at this time, the extraordinary diversity of pharmaceuticals now distributed for various purposes and various reasons, many of which do contain uh, narcotic materials or derivatives therefrom, and the stress of the time in which we live, these together may cause individuals to come under some measure of addiction without even knowing it. And while, of course, we do not like to think that that bottle of aspirin represents anything, we may be taking two or three extra cups of coffee, we may be using various so-called soft drink beverages which contain materials considered stimulating. Uh, these minor uh, fringe uh, narcotics are coming rather close uh, to the lives of many people. Perhaps one of the most uh, difficult to cope with is the possibility of certain habit-forming materials appearing in soft drinks which may even be given to children. Now this doesn't intend to be a frightening presentation, but I think it's something we should keep in mind every day as our own tensions rise and the need for some type of release from tension comes very close uh, to our personal living. Narcotic addiction in this country broadly divides into two classifications. One is the adult addict, and the other is the juvenile addict. I've been trying to get some kind of satisfactory figures as to the number of addicts which we probably have in the United States at this time. Formal reports vary from 50,000 to 80,000. But I have a very definite feeling that these reports are not really accurate. I suspect strongly that addiction is greater uh, than we like to admit. And as a great part of it uh, never comes to public attention, possibly is fought out in the privacy of human lives, I would suspect that addiction will run from 50% to 100% above the generally published figures. This does not necessarily mean that we have an epidemic or a critical situation. But it does mean that the average person is subjected to contact with narcotic materials. And up to the present time, no satisfactory solution has been found uh, to cope with the situation. Most experts agree that the only really satisfactory solution is a preventive program. Unless you have personally been in contact with narcotic addicts, as I have, it is difficult to imagine the dilemma in which they find themselves. A very large number of these addicts 
actually gain very little even passing personal satisfaction. The penalties are too heavy, the consequences are too tragic. Yet the drug addict is in a very different situation from the average alcoholic. The alcoholic does respond uh, to a skillful program of therapy in a large number of cases. And the marvelous work carried on by Alcoholics Anonymous has won worldwide respect. I might point out, however, that even in the alcohol bracket there is much more than may at first appear. The plight of the alcoholic is not limited by any means to what we might term Main Street problems. We are not dealing with the wino who has to have his cheap wine. We are not dealing with the frustrated, disappointed, impoverished alcoholic. Alcoholism has struck into practically every bracket of our national life. In one community, for example, there is at the present time a branch of Alcoholics Anonymous that handles nothing but alcoholic clergymen. Now, can you really face this situation? These men do not want to be alcoholic. But they have in one way or another gradually drifted into uh, this situation. A number of uh, prominent leaders in religious life have become alcoholics and in a few instances narcotic addicts, partly due to the tremendous pressure of their own programs, the type of work they are doing, uh, the continual demand upon their mental and emotional energy, and an increasingly heavy uh, responsibility denying them most of the normal relaxations and rests that people require to maintain adequate balance. We use alcoholism perhaps as a picture of our situation largely because it shows the immediate reaction of tension upon human habit. Now, alcohol has been a problem with humanity since the beginning of history. And it is just one of these interesting examples of how we can go a long way on the so-called roads of culture and civilization without correcting basic personal traits and characteristics. We are probably a million years old or more as human beings. I'm speaking now on a very conservative anthropological basis, which would be sustained by universities and by anthropologists. And yet, for instance, in this million years of human development, the average person has not yet reached that state of civilization in which he can control a temper fit. This is pretty tragic. We have done nothing practically to end jealousy. We have done very little uh, to end the ruthless ambitions and highly competitive attitudes of so-called prominent people. We are not speaking of the great problems at the moment, although these stem from these so-called roots in human character. It seems terrible that we have not been able to solve the problem of war. But this is a very massive situation, and most individuals feel completely unable to cope with war. Yet the average person who does not believe in war, and does not want war, is still unable to prevent himself from arguing with his own neighbors. There is this tremendous immediate participation of people in tension situations. And wherever tension rises in critical periods, we find this situation becoming intensified. We know that among most primitive peoples, both uh, alcohol and the narcotic groups, were essentially, originally, strangely enough, a part of religious custom. Uh, most of our so-called narcotics can be traced in their development to the religious beliefs of ancient peoples. The purpose of the narcotic being to create 
a state of consciousness or an interior transformation of being where by intensity or even by hallucination the individual seemed to be able to contact another dimension of the universe. We know that in early times the church itself was accused of drugging the communion cup. We know these things happened. We're not at all proud of them and we feel that it is high time that many of these ills be corrected. But at the present time the average person is not seriously interested in correcting problems. Therefore, instead of using his own abilities to solve his dilemmas, he is leaning more and more heavily upon escapes. And of course, both alcohol and narcotics constitute escape mechanisms. In this country, the adult narcotic addict has perhaps a 20 to 30 percent chance of recovery. Some will say that this is a negative or pessimistic point of view. But explorations and experimentations and groups formed to cope with the narcotic problem all come to the same general agreement, namely that the results are very inadequate, unsatisfactory, and unpredictable. The uh, narcotic addict seemingly is more damaged more rapidly than the alcoholic. And while the chronic alcoholic can be a problem to himself, his family, and his world, uh, the narcotic addict becomes a more immediate problem and a more desperate one in a comparatively short length of time. A narcotic is often confused with a stimulant. We have the idea that certain drugs put the individual to sleep and others wake him up. While it is true that so-called basic stimulants can be and are available, the majority of so-called stimulants are actually themselves narcotics. In other words, they achieve an appearance of stimulation by drugging some part of the mental-emotional nature. The so-called stimulant effect is simply the individual's release from the barrier of his own natural inhibitions. A person in full control of his faculties uh, is influenced strongly by tradition, by circumstances around him, by his social standing, by his community responsibilities, by his religious convictions, and by his economic interests. He therefore has a tendency to protect himself against any attitude or action which is liable to damage him socially or economically. Under the influence of so-called narcotics, however, those faculties which have to do with the direction and control of energy are reduced in their effectiveness. That part of the individual which is guardian over the rest is the part that goes to sleep, or at least is benumbed, or its effectiveness reduced. As a result of that, the individual suddenly finds release from discipline, from the discipline of himself. This release is the type of release that is fully and completely enjoyed by an adolescent. This is the type of freedom, uh, not now necessarily freedom from the domination of other people, but freedom from the dominion of self. This freedom constitutes a means or a, an occasion for a tremendous release of sub-threshold energies. The individual no longer under control becomes animated. He is animated, however, always on a lower level than that of his control. Uh, if he was actually completely integrated as a psychic being, he probably would act the same under a narcotic that he does while he is fully conscious. But as each person is in conflict with himself, 
and his very uh, motives for becoming addicted to some form of stimulant is itself related to this. It simply follows that the person begins to reduce his barriers and this in turn lowers the level of his psychic function. Under the alcohol or even under certain narcotics, he is subject to delusion of grandeur, delusion of freedom, delusion of importance. He is allowed to express many secret impulses and instincts which under normal conditions he would regard as unpleasant or at least ridiculous. But once he has lowered these barriers, especially if he is in the company of other persons, equally ridiculous, his attitudes seem to him to be adequate and an escape uh, from some heavy responsibility or heavy duty or heavy decision uh, which he feels um, he cannot properly carry. I think that both alcoholism and narcotic addiction have a certain relationship to the incredible increase in the tempo of modern industry and economics. A great number of alcoholics, and I strongly suspect from cases that I have considered, a number of narcotic addicts are persons who are trying to keep pace uh, with an economic situation which is beyond their ability to face squarely and honorably. Under the pressure of executive managements and under the general theory of the high competition of our time, individuals are expected to produce more, achieve more, bear more, work more in certain areas that is reasonable or proper for them. Now this does not necessarily so strongly affect ordinary physical labors as executive brackets. The executive is expected to produce. If he does not produce, he is replaced. Within reason, an executive is presumed to have abilities to produce. But he cannot possibly uh, keep a tempo in which his own needs, his own limitations, his own health are of no interest whatever to those for whom he works. They are interested only in what he accomplishes. And if accomplishing tears him apart, he is expendable and replaceable. This situation goes further, however, in modern industry. Our modern economic situation is in one of the most ridiculous states that it is possible to imagine. It is no longer sufficient for an individual to know his business. It is no longer possible for business to be normally transacted in office hours under proper situations. Today, business is a curious combination of high-pressure salesmanship and high-pressure social activity. The successful man, particularly in uh, a critical spot in an industry, is expected to please every potential customer and to have every weakness of the man he's trying to sell to. As a result of that, more and more business is being transacted at bars and clubs. And today, a young executive who declines to be an alcoholic will probably re be replaced on that ground alone. He is simply not permitted to be in industry in a key situation if he is going to embarrass those with whom he is associated. And if the customer drinks, the salesman had better drink so that they'll both be alcoholics together. <laughs> Now, with more and more business being transacted in this manner, an ever greater dependence upon uh, the credit card and its privileges, business today is becoming a highly involved problem of lowering resistances by any possible means.
This continued over a period of time is bound to have a detrimental effect upon health, and it is striking directly at young people in their 20s who are trying to find their way into industry today. Uh, the social life of our country is falling apart at the seams as far as anything important is concerned. Instead of social relationship being the basis of social improvement, it is now the fundamental prerequisite of wasting time. And in order to waste time and be bored to death, the individual nearly always finds it convenient to become partly unconscious. <laughs> It is pretty difficult to be in full possession of your faculties and spend most of your time with people who are not. <laughs> Today it is becoming a problem in young people establishing homes. It is a problem in all of our universities. It is a problem everywhere. As to uh, some way of coping with this we'll almost say medicinal technique for being a bore. Well, that's what it approximately amounts to. Now, the general situation is further intensified by world conditions. The average person of a generation or two ago had a feeling that life was in some way rather important. Perhaps it was only important in terms of the very fundamental interests of human life. The average young person expected to grow up, go to work, build a home, and raise a family. He felt reasonably certain that if he turned in a good job, employment was secure. But after he got to be about 65 years old, he would be retired, they would give a banquet for him and present him with a standing clock. This was the usual procedure. Occasionally they buried it and gave him a reading lamp or something of that nature with a plaque on it. This plaque was important. didn't mean anything, but it represented evidence of faithful service, faithfully given. And uh, to a measure, this very simple pattern influenced this man's sons who felt that respectability was largely in following the father's footsteps. In the last 25 years, the world has become so neurotic in its reactions that there is no longer the possibility of pointing out to the average person the importance of maintaining the dignity of his own character, the importance of sustaining his own health, and the importance of protecting his life and the lives of others. These matters are no longer important. The individual feels that his future can end in little better than ulcers, and that there is an even probability that anything he builds up will be destroyed by war or by the unreasonable manipulation of finances, which more or less distinguish our times. Between war and inflation, between the various pressures of debt and responsibility, the person does not feel that life is an adventure. To the average person, life is a sentence. It is a sentence to remain self-supporting as long as possible and then let the government take over. This situation is basically so bad uh, that the possibility of handling it on the level of heart-to-heart -heart talk with a person in trouble the effort to stimulate some natural dignities, uh, the attempt to point out the importance of clean living, these things just simply fall off. They are meaningless. The individual does not believe in his world. He does not believe in its policies. He does not believe in his own participation in it. Therefore, he is not particularly concerned with whether anyone is proud of him or not. Of course, this does not apply to everyone, but it applies to a continually increasing group that is already a substantial minority. And it is in this type of group that most of our difficult problems uh, can be found. 
In the last several years, on the side of the juvenile problem, I have been called in in connection with juvenile drug addiction. People have come to me with their stories. I've tried to gain my assistance in extricating a loved one, a child, from one of these situations. In three cases that came along one after the other in the course of about six months. The first point that the parent made in connection with the drug addiction of a child was total astonishment. They had no idea that the boy or girl was in trouble. They had no idea there was anything wrong. Everything apparently that was necessary, proper, and adequate was present. There was no economic need. The young person was not falling behind in studies. Uh, they apparently had an interesting life. The parent simply had no way of explaining it. It simply came as a bombshell that their boy or girl had suddenly been picked up as a narcotic. Going a little further into the problem, however, it, it was a little astonishing that a chain of circumstances which would lead to narcotic addiction was completely unknown to an observant parent. It just seems as though such things could not be. And as we went into the situation, it became obvious that we were not dealing with observant parents. We, are we were dealing with individuals who in one way or another were totally unable to cope with their own children. One of the uh, situations that was pointed out is, uh, was that the child of today cannot be controlled. That the old controls that used to be adequate are no longer adequate. The girl of 14 wants to stay out till 2 o'clock in the morning. All her friends do. And all she will do if she's denied this privilege is come home and weep. She's, she is being cruelly mistreated. Not too long ago, a girl that was not permitted to stay out until 2 o'clock in the morning committed suicide. Now, this is a, a rather uh, confusing picture. But it does bespeak the importance of environment and of the general patterns of society upon the individual. Uh, problem children, as one expert has said, are nearly always children with problems. And one of the problems of the modern child, and a lot of young people have come to me with this, is absolute lack of leadership on the part of parents. The parent is not leading. The parent does not attempt to lead until the child has developed so many bad habits that it can no longer be led. You cannot allow a child to do as it pleases until it is in trouble, and then suddenly assume a strong parental attitude. It's much too late and too little. The average family, I talked to the father of one of these boys that was in trouble. I said, what do you do in the family that is interesting? Do you enjoy reading good books? No. Do you go out with your children? Do you take them places and do things with them? Have them time. Do you uh, have hobbies or crafts to share with these children? No. Uh, what do you do about their religious training? Oh, they go to church sometimes. And we found out that they went to church sometimes alone. The parent did not go. The parent's solution was this. It is hard enough to make a living today. We have to fight our own problems, and if we supply these young people with a good home, good food, good clothing, and an education, that's all we can do. But it apparently isn't enough. In uh, surveying a group of narcotic uh, uh, juveniles not long ago, out of ten, a report came in that eight admitted under questioning that they were living in broken or semi-broken homes, that there was no compatibility between the parents, no real effort 
to create a home. These young people were boarding in a house or an apartment, but they were not living in a home. Uh, the actual situation that might have created any strong relationship in the family was lacking. These young people were out, no one knew where. They would come back, no one knew when. They were doing, no one knew what. But it was assumed, for some mysterious reason, that because they came from a fairly respectable level, because they had had a twenty or thirty thousand dollar home, because they were receiving the advantages of modern living, that these young people should work out their moral problems themselves, that they had every inducement to be good citizens. This is not actually true. These young people were lacking the one thing which is probably the only ultimate cure for juvenile narcotic addiction, and that is internal stamina. Now, what is this stamina? Is it something that can be shouted by the judge or can be created by the probation officer or will be developed into a magnificent maturity by two years in jail? The answer is no. It cannot be done in this way. Stamina consists of resource within the person, the natural and proper instinct to cling to what is good and to turn against what is not good. This stamina has nothing to do with education as we know it. This stamina has nothing to do with Greek and Latin. It has nothing to do with a degree in physics or atomic science. This stamina is something that has to be developed within the character of the child. And it takes a little thinking and a little work to do it. And where the work and the thinking begin, too many modern parents leave off. They are not concerned. I think our old friend Komensky, the great Moravian educator who created our public school system, I think he had the simple answer. That character is built before the child goes to school. And if the child's character is not established before it is seven years old, it'll be a problem from then on out. Now this problem does not necessarily mean it'll be a drug addict. But this child is going to be a difficult person in marriage. This child is going to be poorly adjusted in economics. This child will not use but will abuse friends. This child will have more wants than can reasonably be satisfied. This child will be more extravagant than the social position of the parents justifies. Now how are we going to get this stamina in there? The answer is it has to start when the child is born. The child has to be given certain basic principles, stated as simply and naturally as possible. And one of these principles is pride in honor. And a child that is comparatively young can begin to appreciate the principles of right character, honesty, truthfulness, um, recognition of respect for parent, respect for government, respect for life. By the time the child is six or seven years old, much has been accomplished. We know, for example, that juvenile delinquency is much less prominent in all its forms. Where children, for example, in early life have had pets. If a small child has a puppy dog or a kitten, or the famous and familiar rabbit, or the famous and uh, rapidly multiplying guinea pig. This situation causes the small child to have an experience of sympathy for living things. The helplessness, the friendliness, the happiness, the cuteness of this little animal brings sympathy out of the child. If, however, 
we wait too long until the delinquency factor is too prominent then we have children that will torture animals it has to do with getting started early it has to do with getting started as soon as comprehension is possible and as Comenius points out very clearly you cannot appeal to the intellectual maturity of a five-year-old child you cannot explain to this child the operations of parliamentary procedure nor can you satisfactorily warn this child of the danger of prison punishment or anything of this nature the child doesn't live in that kind of a world therefore Kaminsky points out there's one thing you can always depend on however and that is that the child will copy the person he loves and will imitate the character of the individual he respects therefore the greatest way of instructing the young is example simple example example of true friendliness and understanding between parents if this is impossible due to circumstances over which one of the parents has no control then this one parent who understands must try in every way possible uh, to still maintain this mood or this creativity I know one young man who left home at 16 and became a criminal this came from a divided family but this is not the most important thing the person he was living with spent 90 percent of their time condemning criticizing and berating the absent parent the hatred of the parent he was living with was so intense that the young man finally left home simply to get away from hatred by that time however his own character was badly damaged so the prevention of most of our problems lies in example and early indoctrination example we're bringing religion into the life of the small child a quiet time together an evening prayer these things help to create in children values which will go on to support them when they get in high school or college and suddenly find themselves among young people whose characters or morals are not what they should be so the beginning of all prevention in the line and level of the juvenile must be in the home where the problem begins and it is far better as many experts have pointed out for the family to simplify its living it is absolutely not necessary and never has been necessary for a child to be brought up in a fifty thousand dollar home that the parents can't afford it nor has it been necessary that this child have its own swimming pool or its own automobile at 16. these are not the necessities of life if in order to maintain this level the parents have to neglect the child it is better for them to move down to a level where they can live comfortably within their means and devote more attention to their children you bring this home to the parent however and in all too many instances you discover that the parent is a status seeker themselves and that the child is being sacrificed to this so we have these situations for which very little in a legislative way can be accomplished every possible means can be used uh, to deter uh, the narcotic addict particularly the juvenile and in educational institutions where adequate enlightenment on this subject has been brought to the children early there is a notable decrease but not an extinction of the difficulty also it is quite true that due to the important confused state of modern society children should be taught the basic principles of character and adjustment much earlier than has previously been considered necessary today a child needs to know how to live just about as soon as it needs to learn the multiplication table we give up any hope of their ever learning the alphabet this is practically out but we can have hope that they will develop certain basic characteristics so we have this situation that much of our delinquency arises in our concept of what is a good home what is a proper attitude of the parent 
So the parent is not always, by any means, intentionally to blame. He is unable to cope with the situation himself. But when a parent is unable to cope with the problems arising in a family, it is not unreasonable to assume that the children in that family cannot cope with them either. And that simply to bury the problem, or to hide it, or to forget it, will never solve anything. Actually, we are here in this world to learn. And one of the things that people learn, and must learn, is the management of family. And unless this is taken on in a more serious manner, we're going to have the continuation of this problem. We cannot substitute uh, a busy, successful career for family. Actually, there is no particular advantage in it from a psychological standpoint. Career is important. And uh, many individuals need a certain amount of a authority and executive responsibility for the development of their own characters. But all of these people will be healthier if they know when to close the door of the office, when to go home and have a family relationship with those who are close to them. This is a balance which is tremendously necessary. If a man moves out of the problems of an office only into the problems of a home, he is nowhere. And he gradually becomes of little social value to his own family, and little inspiration or consolation to them. Our addiction problem is arising among young people from the very same roots as nearly all other discontents. And it is this very same type of situation that leads to private iconoclasm where the young person becomes disillusioned, and whether they develop any other bad habits or not, this habit of cynical reaction to life is bad in itself. There is the lack of warmth and understanding, and most young people that I have discussed drug addiction with have declared themselves to be primarily lonely, with no opportunity to share value with anybody. Therefore, substituting for this sharing of value, whatever thrills can come along. Unless we gear some part of our culture to the protection of our young, we're going to have trouble. And this goes to entertainment, television, all of these things. As long as the young person is merely considered as present, and it is assumed uh, that any commercial project can go its merry way regardless of what it does to him. As long as this attitude continues, we are going to be in a serious situation, and as this serious situation gradually unfolds to the maturity of these neglected entities, we're going to have world problems and uh, more difficult situations than we have ever faced before. In most of the treatment on the subject of narcotics, the principal problem has been how to curb or control the availability of narcotic drugs. This is also a very important thing. But in many parts of the world, narcotic plants are grown publicly and with uh, legal sanction. The theory underneath it being, of course, that a certain amount of narcotic material is necessary in the practice of medicine. This is true. And there's no use penalizing human suffering in order to curb a situation. There are cases in which narcotics are a blessing, and they are necessary. And I don't think anyone would want to go back to the time uh, in the 17th century, in Holland, for example, where after a battle, wounded men were herded together or carried on stretchers, and their legs were sawed off without an anesthetic and the stump was cauterized with a red-hot iron. I don't think we want that back. On the other hand, we also know that the amount of narcotic material legally produced in the world is far in excess of the medical requirement. And this, of course, does not take into consideration uh, that uh, type of narcotic which is illicitly produced or grown in areas where control and research are impossible. 
The work of the League of Nations in connection with narcotics was heroic. But it was frustrated by the simple problem that drugs are profitable. And today we are much more concerned with profit than we are with principle. Now, if we have money enough uh, to launch a man into orbit, if we have money enough to conquer the moon, if we have scientific skill enough to produce the wonders that we deal daily read in the paper, we know that it is only a matter of a little effort and a little thought and a little honest research for the narcotic situation as we know it does not even need to exist any longer. Inasmuch as it is perfectly possible today with the skill already apparent and already present to produce the type of narcotic that is required in the practice of medicine of a type that is non-habit forming, non-addicting, and harmless. This can be done. There is actually no need whatever uh, for in uh, modern scientific process for the use of these dangerous habit-forming drugs that may contribute to so-called ordinary drug addiction or may contribute to the more specified and specific types known as medical addiction. In other words, it is quite possible that the legitimate need for what we call narcotic drugs can be completely solved without any further production of this material. It can be done by other methods that are not dangerous and in many instances are no longer even uh, pharmaceutical or chemical as we know it today. The increasing use, for example, of hypnotic therapy uh, presents a situation which under reasonable control cannot be habit forming. And the average person cannot perform this function on himself Therefore, uh, he is not likely to get into difficulty. The amount of training necessary would train him for something better. The use of the narcotic, therefore, can be not only controlled, but within five years, with a little work and effort, could end entirely. But there is very little probability that this will be accomplished. It involves too many phases of our highly involved economic profit theory. But here is one way in which it could be fairly adequately handled. Now your mature addict presents a whole series of other situations. Your mature drug addict is in, in most cases of one way or another a sick person. Your mature addict is an individual whose mature life experiences have reduced his individuality, have crippled his psychic integration, have left him frustrated, neurotic, bored, or perhaps downright sick. I think we must assume that any mature person who is able to read the daily newspaper, who is able to sit down and watch even a western on television, is capable in one minute of quiet thinking of realizing what drug addiction will do to him. The proof, the evidence, everything necessary is not only available to him, but within the last five years has literally been thrown at him. There is no person above the level of a moron who does not know the danger of drug addiction. Therefore, the only answer to the problem is not that ignorance, but something else. And this something else is the pressure of what he terms necessity. In his case, he has already let go, and his addiction is one form of psychic suicide. He no longer really wants to live. He no longer really wants a decent, normal, proper way of life. He may even reach, have reached the point where he does not believe that such normal, proper ways exist. He is personally disillusioned. He is generalized upon his own experience to discouragement, despair, or compound indignation against society. He may also be, and usually is, a person who has no resources 
in higher thinking, religion, philosophy, or things of this nature. He is either a disillusioned intellectual or a a demoralized emotional. He is simply lacking integration value. And we find in every community a certain group of these individuals who even without drug addiction are no ornament to the community, but with it are very much less of an ornament. And these in turn become means for the distribution of the problem to others. One of the great dangers, of course, of the drug addiction is that the addict becomes absolutely dependent upon his narcotics. And as these narcotics, except in a very few cases, are beyond his normal economic means, and the very process of addiction gradually reduces his economic status, he is forced into some other form of illegal activity. One of the most common, of course, for the addict is to become the peddler. To gain his own supply by actually going out and making new addicts. And individuals have reached that level in which they have made addicts of their own children for that reason. This means that the addiction itself completely destroys normal resistance, normal ethical uh, patterns and controls. Now the phase of this problem which also gravely concerns the authorities in this country is the illicit drug industry or the tremendous mechanism by means of which narcotics are distributed illegally throughout the country. It is only possible for this to occur because of a highly organized and extremely wealthy syndicate procedure. And in spite of every effort to protect our borders against drug invasion, a very large amount of it does come through and will continue to under the present procedure. Now I think it is a mistake for us to assume uh, that this condition is due to the corruption of our border officials. I do not think this is true. Most of these men are very honorable, respectable, definitely dedicated persons. But it is uh, not possible, particularly in this age of aviation, to guard borders adequately. The narcotics come in from many areas. They come in from the Orient. uh, They come in from Latin America. They come in from Africa. And these uh, drugs are distributed by international combines. And these combines are so cleverly organized and so powerfully entrenched that even the best narcotic enforcement officer probably will never find out who is actually responsible for the motion of these drugs. Uh, the basic cause for the problem is not to be reached on this level. It lies much deeper. I think, for instance, in England, your average Englishman is not as ambitious as the average American. The average Englishman does not expect uh, to become affluent overnight. The average Englishman, born in trade, expects to stay there. Born in profession, hopes he can maintain it. Born to wealth, hopes he can pay the taxes. It's an entirely different situation. The personal craving for status, it just is not as intense. Nor is it necessary to their thinking that they have this endless round of conveniences and commodities that we know. Only a few years ago, there were large hotels in London maybe with 100, 200 rooms and one bathtub. And there is where the queuing up was, by the way. (laughs) This type of attitude is so different from ours that they're just not to be compared. Here in this country, we have tremendous intensities of ambition, tremendous intensities of frustration. Well, I think the English are developing considerable frustration 
I don't think they're entirely happy with this situation. They're certainly watching their empire fall apart. But at the same time, these patterns, these tight patterns, uh, are quite different. And it's very different to watch. For instance, an American senator riding up in front of the Capitol building in a nice, long, sleek automobile with a little flag on the fender, and a member of parliament riding up to the House of Parliament on a bicycle in a tall silk hat. This is different. But as one Englishman told me, he said, we've got one thing on you, however, old man. The bicycle is paid for. <laughs> up to a very few years ago, I can't tell you just how it is now, but up to the middle 40s at least, the average Englishman didn't have a bank account. He never had a checking system. You had to have, you had to have an important social position before you get a checkbook. You just didn't do things that way. And while to us that's very backward, still this very backwardness, I think, does have a bearing on the fact that they're rather backward in their drug addiction also. They have not even begun to catch up, and they never will. Over here we have a very different problem. We have the individual beating himself into a constant fatigue about which and for which he has no remedy. We have another issue, I think, that uh, we can't put into the reports, and this is the point I want to particularly stress for a few minutes anyway, and that is man is a being consisting of certain parts. These parts include not only his physical body, but what the old theologian called his soul, what we call his psychic integration, his spiritual nature, by which he is related to a divine cause and principle in the universe. The individual is a creature operating from within a core life in himself. Actually, the human personality is not only a product of law, universal law, but it unfolds and operates in obedience to universal law. This law is very largely the law of cause and effect. It certainly manifests in that way. More than this, man as a being has a reason, a purpose, and a methodology that arises within the divine nature from which he is suspended. Actually, therefore, man's problem in life always has been and always will be a very simple one, namely, adjustment to reality. Adjustment to the principles, the values, the energies by which his life is sustained. Therefore, that which violently disobeys or disregards uh, the pattern of universal purpose must ultimately come in a head-on conflict with universal purpose. And in this conflict, there's no question as to who's going to win. Universal purpose is going to win. Man can differ from man, but man cannot differ from the essential laws governing the energies of his own existence. Nor can he neglect these laws nor can he pervert them. Every effort that he makes to do so brings trouble to him. In some mysterious way, out of the infinite wisdom, man was finally bestowed a mind. This mind is to be the leader of his conduct. This mind, therefore, is the reason why he is a person. It is the reason why he is an individual. It is the reason why he is no longer a member, just a member of the animal kingdom. This mind has purposes. And the principal purpose that lies behind mental function is that the mind shall become more and more capable of intelligently leading the composite objective life of the person. 
Therefore, mind over matter is a rule for man. The mind must, however, not only be a ruler, but it must be a just ruler. It must be an enlightened ruler. It cannot merely be an autocrat. In order to enlighten and, in, and justly govern, the mind itself must become informed, must be wise, must have essential knowledge sufficient to direct the processes of its own conduct. To attain this wisdom and this understanding, nature has provided a methodology, and this methodology is called experience. The individual, therefore, is continually placed in situations which challenge him, which require thought, judgment, understanding, dedication, devotion. These experiences are calling upon him continuously to be himself, to be his best self and to provide him with the necessary instruments by which he can make right decisions, in which he can elevate principles above the pressures of prejudice and private ambition. Now if we take this chain of vehicles, this perfectly simple, direct, natural procedure, and we interfere with it, what do we actually do? We attempt to bring the individual into some kind of satisfaction at the expense of his own consciousness. We attempt to say this, that consciousness itself is a moral agent, that it is a worrier under some conditions, that it warns us not to do what we should not do, that not only from our own experience, but from the atavistic experience of our tribe, it tells us some things we cannot do. If we insist upon trying to do them, we are in trouble. The mind, therefore, is like a parent with certain differences. The mind is forever capable of growing, building, knowing more solving more. But in order to solve anything, the mind must gradually come into what Socrates calls a state of moderation. The moment the mind is used merely for the gratification of ambition, the individual is sick. The moment the mind is used only for the gratification of pleasure, the mind is thus sickened. The purpose of the mind is to contribute to the total growth of the person. Now the total growth of the person is only possible if that person is allowed to exist in a condition in which they can grow. Now there are two things that prevent a person from growing. One of these is to place that person or cause that person to place himself in a situation which he cannot control, which he cannot direct and which therefore he becomes the victim of rather than the leader over. The second problem is to in some way destroy the conscious leadership of the mind and cause it to no longer draw the person to those principles which are right for him. These two situations are interrelated continuously. The average person today is not so natally stupid that they cannot govern or regulate their own conduct to a reasonable degree. But this regulation of conduct interferes with something that has become the fetish of our people in the last 50 years, and that is the inalienable right to do as we please, unfortunately not knowing what we please. Therefore, a more or less blind devotion to absolute freedom of action. We can discomfort, discourage, and afflict the mind by placing the person under heavy debt for which he sees no release, causing him to attempt to bluff his way into a career for which he's not fitted, creating or permitting to exist a home situation which is an utter frustration upon all involved, 
or by any one of a number of unreasonable situations, many of which today are associated with this eternal process of status seeking. When the mind reaches a point where it can no longer cope with its own physical problems, where its extravagances have become as habitual as a narcotic, where the debt and responsibility close around the person until he is unable to cope with it, at that time the individual ceases to grow. Because he stops growing when he gives up. And he will give up if the obstacle is too big. It no longer remains a challenge. It becomes an absolute frustration. Under these conditions, we find a rapid deterioration of man's mental, emotional, psychic integration. The second situation very often is merely a manifestation of the first. The individual does not like to live in a constant conflict with his own character. His character says, live modestly. Situations cause him to say, I want to live extravagantly, or I must live extravagantly. The extravagance of the way of life and the natural cautions of the mind are in conflict. The individual knows he should not go in debt beyond a certain reasonable degree for essentials. But he wants things, or those around him want things. He hasn't strength enough to control his own wants, nor strength enough to direct the needs of those around him. So he gradually falls into these patterns. As this conflict becomes greater, it becomes subjectively obvious to the individual that his own life as a person is threatened. He is no longer an individual growing. He no longer has time to relax, to think, to meditate, to read good books. He has no longer any communion with life or nature. His idea of a day in nature today is a freeway at 60 miles an hour. He no longer has any peace in his own life. No chance to know himself. No chance actually to know the people around him who are equally busy and have no interest in knowing him. This situation leads gradually to the psychic sense of futility. The individual's real purpose is frustrated. He sees no escape. Yet he knows he is a purposed creature. And he comes into a terrible, deadly locking. He has things within him which are bigger than his action. He cannot escape the bigness and he cannot make it work in life. So where is he? He is in danger of a mental breakdown, nervous breakdown. He may be one of that vast number becoming a mental problem to the country and the world. He may try to fight it out, end up with ulcers, end up with uh, a heart attack, a stroke, or general exhaustion. To cope with this situation and its total loss of value, the individual sees only one proper duty, and that is to stop the small, still voice that tells him he's a fool. Now, this may be a rather blunt way of putting it, but the time is getting short, so you'll excuse me if we leave the trimmings off. We don't like other people to call us fools. We won't speak to them again, even though in the privacy of our own lives we agree with them. So we are tired of being nagged at by our own common sense. We are tired of being reminded that it's just our own weak lack of courage that has allowed us to get into this mess. We also get a little tired of realizing that this mess is spreading, and that we are living in it, that it is worse than any smog we've ever known, that into this same mess our own children must go. These things become very tiresome thoughts. We become more and more unable to stand the loneliness of communion with ourselves. So the answer seems to be one thing. If you can't do anything about it, block the voice of conscience. Block the thing that tells you you're a fool. 
Block this thing that warns you against extravagance. Figure, well, so it's bankruptcy. All right, the next week I'll be back in business, a perfectly honored business businessman again. This uh, type of angle results in the ability of the person to come under these powerful escape mechanisms. The young person with no future has nothing to live for. The older person with a less future and much more past doesn't want to think about it. And each individual being in himself some way a kind of godlike being, something that wants to create, something that wants to be a person, and to win the true and honorable recognition of society. This person locked in this predicament simply decides uh, to laugh it off, decides that alcohol will give him the big laugh, that narcotics will gradually permit him to forget how foolish he is, will give him an opportunity for a moment to feel that he rules the universe, and then the morning after. I know men today in this town, several of them personally, or very dearly personally, who work five days a week, they just work themselves to death from 9 to 4.30 with about five coffee breaks. <laughs> Not one of them has done an honest day's work in the last five years, by the way. But having reached payday, they proceed to take pay and go on the weekend binge. Saturday and Sunday, you can't even find them. They couldn't find themselves in the most cases. Monday morning, they're a wreck. They go to work to sober up on the company payroll. They have a headache that is monumental. They are utterly miserable. They swear to you on Monday morning that never again in their lives will they take a drink. Friday night, they start again. And they've been doing this for years. This is living. And they will tell you that that weekend is the most important thing in the world. From about Tuesday to Friday, they think of nothing else. On Monday and Tuesday, they don't want to think about it at all. <laughs> now, this situation is certainly no human condition. And the only way it can endure is that the humanity of the individual has been so completely undermined that the value of life to that person is infinitely reduced. Now, of course, in Buddhism, Buddha pointed out in his day that where a situa situation of this kind pertains, and it pertained in his day, always has, that what the person is doing is taking a nice long span of years for which they had to work pretty hard. After all, it's quite a nuisance to be born, not only to other people, but to yourself. It's not pleasant uh, to go through the process of teething. The uh, summer complaint and gradually the childhood diseases and it isn't easy to get over the remedies that we are now using for these ailments either. <laughs> it's not too easy to go to school and grow and go through all the problems of adolescence, everything you can think of. It's not too easy to get out and try to make a living. It's kind of hard to get into this world and get, you know, into some shape to do something. And so, having worked at this as hard as we have, Lots of people just decide they're not going to do anything with the job. The Buddha pointed out that the answer to that is they will have the glorious privilege of going through it all over again. <laughs> and if they decide to be alcoholics or narcotic addicts for the next 50 lives, at the end of those 50 lives they will have to pick up where they should have started 50 lives earlier and still go on with it. Because you can't get away with it. That nature has only one end that it will accept, and that's an intelligent human being. 
until it produces that in the individual, it's going to pound that individual. It's going to pursue them closer than the nearest relative. It's going to demand of them everything until they finally decide to get up and do what is right and proper. Now, there's no particular, particular reason why some of these principles should not be brought home to people more clearly than they have been. I have always thought that if many Western persons could believe in reincarnation and believe in it sincerely, it would have an effect on their lives because it would give them at least this realization that they cannot drink themselves to oblivion and that no matter how much they run away by narcotics or any other means, they've finally got to face the facts. Under those conditions, why not face them early and get it over with? It's just exactly like the problem of military training. The teenager doesn't look forward to it with any great amount of pleasure. But knowing it's inevitable, he does it and comes back and carries on the best he can. A sober, reasonable, prudent, provident life is inevitable. The individual will never be permitted to get away with anything else. So we might as well start that way as resist it for years or lives and finally have to do it anyway. So the only answers that we need are not only good for the narcotic and the alcoholic, they're good for everything. Good common sense is the only answer we have for inflation. Inflation is due to the same type of thinking that produces the narcotic. And that thinking is at best psychotic. This same uh, uh, world tension problem is caused by the same things that cause alcoholism. And we are not going to solve alcoholism by simply letting the individual remain a continuing sot. And we're not going to solve international tensions by letting selfish, stupid people go on the way they are. These problems all stem from a few basic roots. And perhaps the most basic of all is that the individual, in order to be a good citizen, an intelligent person, and a healthy human being, has got to make peace with himself. He's got to find out what is important in his own life, why his real values are, and he's got to live according to them. The moment his pressures are not uncontrollable, the narcotic syndicate will fall apart. That has nothing to do. Because nobody wants to pay 20 or 30 dollars for a shot of morphine if he's happy, contented, well-adjusted, and has important things that he wants to do. You do not have to run away from yourself if you've thought through your own life, decided what you needed to do, what you ought to do, and what you therefore choose to do. And if you choose to do that which nature intends you to do, you'll have no tensions of any great seriousness. Nature will supply the remedies for all natural, normal tensions. And in an extreme accident, sick, a serious illness or something of that nature, science can come in and help over an emergency. But where a life is a psychological, continuous emergency, that life is being badly lived. And badly lived lives become winos. They become individuals who we are profoundly sorry for, because life has simply been too big for them. But if we began at an earlier age to give these people values, and if observing their conditions we learn valuable lessons, nature will gradually heal these wounds and things will work out all right for all concerned. But we cannot keep sowing the whirlwind and not continue to reap the whirlwind. So your narcotics problem and all of these problems reduces, uh, re they reduce themselves to this simple problem of the individual who must either live straight or he cannot live with himself. 
And when he cannot live with himself, he is no good to himself and no good to anybody else. And that all the success in the world is not a compensation for the fact that you know inside that you are a failure. And any individual who can't say yes when he means yes and no when he means no is a failure. And an individual who does not say yes to the right things is a failure. And the only reason he doesn't do it is because he hasn't developed his own natural resources. And this lack of development or the perversion of developed faculties that gets him into trouble. So the narcotic problem has, it can be solved by a kind of education. But it's the kind of education in which the individual begins to understand his own nature, how he is constituted, why he is constituted that way, and why it is that he must keep the rules. And by keeping the rules, the rules will keep him. If he doesn't do this, he's just in trouble. Time's up, time's up, time's up.